Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spock Financial with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. We've already covered this week's <clears throat> X-Men, Spider-Man, and Avengers books. Now we're moving on to this week's Empire tie-ins, as well as this week's DC books. And we're going to kick things off with Empire number three. Which I'm going to just completely... Come on, say it. I'm honestly surprised that within a month, in the span of four weeks, we've had three issue, the first three issues of Empire. I'm not complaining, I'm just surprised. That's all. So, where we left off in Empire, the combined Kree Scroll Empire had uh, joined forces had joined forces with Earth's heroes because as they now face a common threat the, in the form of the Kotati. Who up until the end of Empire number one, the Avengers considered to be allies. Further also, the half Cree, half human Carol Danvers was uh, named accuser by Emperor Hulkling, well, Emperor Dork the, the Eighth, and. Uh, The Kotai had also began their invasion of Earth. Which would be the beginning of their annihilation of all animal-based life in, in, the, in the galaxy. So we begin with narration from uh, Reed Richards' Thought Journal. Reed Richards' Thought Journal, Supplemental Entry. Thanks to the Alliance flagship's escape shuttles, the Kree Scroll troops of Captain Marvel risked her life to save are now on Earth, taking the fight to the Kotati invaders seeking to end all animal life. As Kree Scroll Emperor, Hulkling has issued rules of engagement, but despite the loyalty of his inner circle, he remains a figurehead. These are cultures that traditionally make war without mercy. In the heat of battle, his rules are often ignored. Events are escalating. I checked on Franklin and Val. They've met with challenges, but they've summoned help, and I firmly believe things are now in hand. The parent in me would like, would like to drop everything, but I have to trust my family. They have this. Others need me more. And so, Reed has arrived at Avengers Mountain, where Tony Stark is working on something. Um... And it turns out also that, uh, apparently, Tony Stark and Johnny Storm use a sim similar mnemonic system when it comes to uh, creating passwords. The, different, the main difference being that uh, the numerical so that Tony included numerical substitutions. And, uh... Tony was already rather unenthused. Now he's even more unenthused, saying that he's slightly smarter than Johnny Storm. Hooray for him. The Thought Journal entry goes on. Normally I'd say something in response to that. Johnny's much more intelligent than he admits, and the best brother-in-law I could have. But, I don't think that crack was aimed at him. Since the big three Avengers escaped from the Kotati on the moon, they've all been busy, each of their respective strengths. Captain America's leading Earth's heroes, super and otherwise, to fight the Kotati across the world. Thor's on a mystical quest, seeking out powers only a god can access. And Tony? Tony has buried himself here. And he's having trouble with what he's working on. Mainly the trouble, though, stems from the fact that he, he believed what the Kotati told him. 
every every word that Gotaghi told him. He lapped it up and asked for seconds. Reed tries to comfort Tony, explaining that the Gotaghi have always been friends to Earth and personal friends to the Avengers. Storzman was an Avenger, even the Kotati version. Nobody could have seen this coming. And Tony says, you know, Reed would have seen it. Though Reed points out that he was, he was there and he did it. Adding that if there's blame to be shared, they'll share it. And that Tony's not alone. Tony walks off saying it's easy for Reed to say you're not alone. And Reed, in his thought journal, Reed adds that Tony does have a point. It's easy for Reed to talk about not being alone, even now when it's just him and, to when it's just him and Tony. But there's a, there's a four on his chest next to his heart. Because a reminder he, he wears that his family is always with him. Speaking of his family, we, met, we next meet up with the Thing in Wakanda, at the border with Azania. Wakandan soldiers are shouting Yibambe, and uh, the Thing asks Shuri if Yibambe means what he thinks it means, and Shuri is surprised that Ben doesn't speak Shosa. Though he, Ben does explain not without his universal translator, which he thinks he left in his other pants. Though Shuri does mention that knowledge is the universal, is the universal translator. Though she also does add that she's not demeaning Ben's. However, some of the Kotati forces breach the force field. And she ex And Ben says, you know, there's always room to know more. And he, he, he gets, he, he gets what, uh, what Shuri's saying. And she translates the Abambe to him. Well, approximately. Either hold firm or hold fast. And so she, and she then asks what Ben thought it meant. Well, Ben thought that it meant it's clobbering time, just as the battle is joined. And Koi is watching the battle from afar and asks Swordsman if uh, the, the troops, the Wakandan. Wakandans and Avengers and Fantastic Four are facing are their elite troops. The swordsman explains that no, it's not their elite. First, they have to test the defenses, discover the weak points. Then, they'll send their best. With Koi saying that, uh, then asking why such caution. The, Ko the Katadi are winning. Against the dead in Genosha, in the savage land of theirs, the Antarctic, all across the world. Adding that in time they will surely overwhelm the Avengers, including their leader. Though Swordsman insists that Koi say the name of the Avengers leader. Adding, and then does so himself, T'Challa of Wakanda, the Black Panther, the most dangerous man alive. He knows about the Death Blossom that they planted on the moon, and, can, and he can put two and two together, thus he knows what they want by now. And he knows why. And yes, he, T'Challa does know what they want. The Great Vibranium Mound. He is certain of that now. Hulk, however, figures that can't be right, because what she's seen in the Kotati, they don't have much use for metal of any kind. But, T'Challa does mention that it's not the metal that, that, that the Kotati want, it's the Earth itself. And Invisible One puts it together, realizing that uh, the vibranium and rich soil. And T'Challa, that's exactly, that's exactly what might such soil grow if misused. He then goes on to add that they saw Kotati bloom grow in the dust of the moon, and its influence was enough to murder an entire fleet of warriors. If Koi can plant a similar flower in the soil of the Great Mound, his power will span the galaxy. However, it appears that t the King T'Challa has a visitor. Uh, 
he also adds that if Koi is able to do that, he will truly be a god and not a kind or loving one. And he's sure that uh, their visitor can, can attest to this. Their visitor being... Well, like it's kind of like once an Avenger, always an Avenger type of situations, but fellow Avenger, Mantis. She explains that, that uh, she is there to save her son. However, Invisible Woman does take some issue with it, explaining that, you know, Koi has taken thousands of sentient lives, millions that they believe his own account. Though Mantis says that he will pay a price for that. It was not his, however, it was not his decision. Koi... Uh, Swordsman whispers in Koi's ear, poisoning him against his human heritage and against all animal life in turn. Why? Mantis knows not. But she believes in her son, and she believes she can reach him, given the chance. And she also makes an excellent point to Sue, you know, basically saying, you know, hey, you're also a mom. You know, would you do any less for your own child? And no, no, Sue wouldn't. And Black Panther agrees that a diplomatic mission is definitely a good idea. You know, it, ending this danger with words is definitely preferable to battle. However, he does add that uh, he does ask that uh, Mantis, Hulk, and his invisible woman forgive him, forgive him if he explores other options besides. We then go to the Kree Skrull Alliance command ship. Super Scroll is uh, explaining a recent battle plan to the Emperor. The plan begins with them once again stabbing a cute Captain Marvel with the space sword. Human Torch is there, and he doesn't like the sound of that plan, namely the stabbing part. Um, Murgan the Mystic, also a Kree Skrull hybrid, um, explains that she can use her magic to boost the energies of the sword for a time and allow Captain Marvel to absorb a higher dose which she then carries to the heart of the garden, the Death Blossom itself, and releases, wiping out the Vitaly infection. However, Johnny, Johnny Storm makes a very good point. The sword nearly killed Carol the first time she was stabbed with it. And, so they're and now they're about turning up the volume. And, you know, it's a suicide mission. But... Carol does kind of point out that it's not the first time she's taken that risk. If it turns the tide, she'll do what she has to do. And so, this is she gets put on Emperor Hulkling. Captain Marvel's ready to fall on his sword, blow herself up for his shiny new alliance. And he's asked if he's anything to say say about it, or if he's really just a figurehead. And he's contacted by Black Panther, calling upon him as from one king to another. And he has a plan, but it requires the Star Sword. Hulkling smiles and like, you too, huh? And uh, he thinks that, Black Panther thinks that with Hulkling's blessing, Black, Black Panther could wield the sword. And he believes that he must. So, Hulkling asks if uh, the big plan Black Panther had has needed Avenger to die. Obviously, the question catches Black Panther off guard, and that's, but apparently it does not. So, Hulkling says, all right, fine, have fun with it. Sends the sword to him.
And Hulkling thinks that uh, Black Panther can make can use the sword better than they can at the moment. Captain Glory disagrees, thinking that perhaps the Emperor's out of his well. Das is kind of the uh, go-to generic intergalactic curse word for Marvel, but damned mine would probably be about right. He explains that this is war and war soldiers die, and they're dying right now because the garden is active. Glory respects the accuser sacrifice. Why won't the Emperor? Super Scroll actually concurs and thinks that what Hulkling is doing is weakness. As Captain Marvel could what could have been a significant blow. However, Hulkling points out that she could have died right here in the throne room, wasting one of our best weapons in the fight. He then and asks, you know, that if he puts it that way, is he cold and practical enough for for the Super Scroll? Does he pass Clorit's test? And Tanoth explains that the uh, the true test or explains that she fears the true true test is yet to come. And asks that Colrit remind Emperor Hulkling of what happened to the crawl system of the Pyre. And apparently that's restricted information. But Emperor Hulkling explains it's not restricted for him, and apparently. Super Scroll's been putting off, been putting off tell, telling him about it for, for too long. The Pyre was referred to as the death of a world. And Super Scroll says, that, yes, it is. And more. It is the death of a sun. Explaining that the Pyre creates an energy buildup in the core of a star. Once the critical point is reached, the star detonates. The Scroll thought they would never use such a weapon. Astronuclear war is unthinkable among civilized races. But then the Katani came to the crawl system, where there was a colony of scroll artists and dreamers who study and imitate the cultures of Earth. Colbert goes on to explain that Rome fell, Chicago died, even Glenbrook discovered new, jo- new genres of horror. Super Scroll had no choice in his actions. Those planets that were infected yet would have been within a standard hour. The crawl system was already dead. And by making their end quick, he could have perhaps finished the battalion with one blow. However, he didn't. It was a practice run. Then the Kotali were already on their way to Earth. Even Captain Marvel's shocked at this. Super Scroll killed billions of people, civilians. Though Super Scroll defends himself, that then he did it to save trillions more, and that in Scroll culture and decree, there are no civilians, only warriors, not yet assigned to battle. If they die with the Empire, they die well. Which, of course, make, makes Emperor Alkling. Reminds Emperor all Hulkling once again at the time that uh, the Super Scroll killed the one he thought was his mother. And asks just what Super Scroll's trying to turn him into. Tanoth responds to the saying, a king. Adding that it's his button, not hand on the button. And she wonders, when it's a choice between one primitive doom planet and a galaxy of truly civilized worlds, if he'll have the strength to do what he must. And Tanoth leaves the room with Captain Glory following, wanting to speak to Tanoth. Adding that she called Ronan the Accuser a hero, a, a hero of the Imperium. But Ronan died standing with the Utopian faction, their enemies. And so Glory started really looking at you, or looking at her. Her gene scan re- read as a pure Cree, but he led the charge at the shapeless bridge. And he knows a scroll when he sees one, whatever their shape. And he then asks how long she's held that one. 
and Tanoth explains, long enough to help make the Kree strong again, make them feared. Which is why she assumes he's told no one else. And, uh, Captain Gloria is curious, because it's an, it's an odd tactic for a Skrull spy. Tanoth explains that she changes shape. It's not. It's not so cute, odd when you gra when when one grasps the bigger picture. Much like Super Scroll, she always knew the destiny of the, tw of the twin empires lay together, ruled by a single bloodline. Hers, for she's not just a, a simple Scroll spy. She is in fact Rakul, Empress of the of the Scrolls, survivor of Galactus, mother of Anel, the Holy Martyr. Grandmother to Doric the Eighth, the King of All Space, and soon her grandson will be absolute ruler of the galaxy. Gloria, Captain Gloria, actually approves of this. Saying it's, it's a worthy goal, it will bring much, <clears throat> much needed order. Though he fears that uh, her grandson has spent too long among the humans. Oh, and now. And all states that the boys caught a nasty case of heroism, and they'll have to do something about that. And that is where the issue ends. Next up, we've got Captain Marvel number 18. Now, this is an Empire tie-in. I'm not going to be discussing what's gone on in previous issues of Captain Marvel, because, well, they don't matter to the story. They're... They're not important to the story being told. The important things are, well, it's just really just covered in Empire number two, three. Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, is now Supreme Accuser. And so, yeah. We open with, in space, the far edges of a battle already lost. The Katati ship is shooting up a Kree scroll. Alliance ship, and um, one of the uh, crewmen mentioned, tells the commander that the shields are zero percent and all weapons are still offline. And one more hit will obliterate them. Apparently, the Gatati are ignoring the hails of surrender. The commander of the ship says that um, well, clearly their fates are sealed. And tells his crew it was an honor and privilege to serve with them. However, another crewman mentions something's coming in fast. And the captain simply says that there are no weapons and power, there's nothing they can do. Or the crewman explains that it, what's coming in isn't coming for them. It's Carol the Accuser. Who then uses her well, accuse her hammer to basically turn the engines of the ship back on so they can get back to the fleet. So they send a, a hail to the command ship and basically go to re rejoin the, the remains of the Kree Scroll Armada. Back at the command ship. Um. Carol's passing up. Carol's passing on news, and I'm honestly kind of thinking that this probably takes place before the events of Empire Number Three, because well, the thing is there. And she said she found one ship being fired upon by the Gotati, and she, she took care of it, repowered the ship, and said ship should be in, on its way to rejoin the Armada. Emperor uh, Emperor Hulkling. Asked if she found anything or anyone else in her search. However, Carol didn't. Um, she did a wide perimeter sweep of uh, only abandoned and destroyed vessels. No survivors beyond the one ship. It's worth noting that the ship was drifting and powerless, and they had hailed the Kotati crew signaling their surrender, and the hails were ignored. And so, Hul Emperor Hulkling asks if, the, if there were any survivors on the, on the Kotati ship. In which Carol sa states that there were not. Invisible Woman goes to talk to uh, 
Carol. Because he thinks maybe some maybe there was something more Carol wanted to say. And Carol explains that the hammer she doesn't know it it's powerful. So and so Sue asks, too powerful? Though Carol says it's not that. Or maybe it is. She doesn't know. It's a huge honor to carry. And she doesn't want to be interested by Little Creek giving it to her. And there are things about holding it that feel so right, but she just doesn't know. Maybe, she, and Sue suggests maybe it's just, well, it takes some getting used to. Which, you know, that might be the case. Then the thing shows up and explains that um, she needed back in the, with the Emperor. They got a big problem. And Carol is sent for the first time to accuse someone. Along the on her way, she it's what's going on is explained to her by the emperor. Um, it turns out that uh, there's a city on the planet Marta N, or the city on. Known as Canal. It was an experimental city, the first of a kind, a sanctuary city. It was supposed to be a place where Skrull and Cree could live beside one another peacefully. It was to be the future of the Alliance. And now it is Ash. Courtesy of a Cree soldier. She's pinned down to pe defending herself, but the small squad said the capture has thus far failed. And so. The Emperor needs Carol to do what the squad could not. Which is bring justice. So, she arrives. Gets information from the troops on the ground. Apparently this is a very smart soldier. Some some men have, have fallen in the traps, and they have no idea what what weapons she has at her disposal. And so, the uh, Kree soldier takes her pot shots at Carol, even throws a grenade at her. And then Carol arrives, and uh, the soldier yields. Which surprises Carol. The soldier introduces herself as being Laurie L, and she has dreamed of nothing but th this day, though she confesses that these circumstances are no, are no part of any dream of hers. Catch this catches Carol a little off guard, and so... She, uh, Carol, explains the charges. Lariel is, uh, accused of atrocity of the highest order, the destruction of a city of peace designed to solidify a fragile alliance and the murder of its citizens. Lariel, uh, understands these charges, and when asked if she's anything to offer her defense, she says she's innocent. Going on to explain, she, though she was born for, born and bred for war, she has no taste for violence. Never has. She would never commit the crimes against her people and the scrolls with whom they have formed a long overdue peace. She mourned them, mourns them all, as well as her crew, who were her only friends in the, in the world. And so, she tells Carol that uh, she looks at the judgment of the hammer wielded by, by Carol, as she knows that Carol is only doing what she has been tasked. And so she says that none of this is what Carol, Carol thinks for herself, saying none of this is what she expected. Can the hammer help her divine truth, or is it simply a weapon of violent justice? She places the head of the hammer on Lariel's head, and is shown a jumble of images, some other Kree soldier, what could be a young Lariel grown in a lab, the aftermath of the tragedy, though not necessarily a murder. And Carol's mother, Mariel. Making L'Oreal Carol's half sister. 
This surprises Carol, even more so. Especially, you know, considering the fact that L'Oreal didn't say anything about it. And L'Oreal explains that uh, it didn't seem fair to Carol, to, given what she was tasked to do. She didn't want Carol to carry her L'Oreal's death on her conscience more than she knew she already would. She just felt grateful to have finally seen her with her own two eyes. And Carol begins to power up the hammer and cut to the ship. As Carol flies away and the soldiers on the ground are being told to raise the command ship. As Carol flies off, she says to herself that um, her relationship with the Kree has always been complicated. And now she's getting even more complicated as she's taken L'Oreal into custody and flown off with her. Which surprises Hulkling to no end. And that is where the issue ends. <laughs> oh boy. That's cool though. Carol's got a Cree half got a Cree half sister. It's always nice to see new uh meet new uh characters, even if, you know, those characters have been around for, like, well over 40 years, but, you know, whatever. Next up, we've got X-Men number 10. So, where we left off with X-Men, this one I'm actually going to go over because, yeah, um... The Summers family were going to take a long overdue vacation to uh, Chandelure in Shi'ar space. But the bird showed up at their doorstep. Big fight broke out over the king egg that uh, Wolf's Bane liberated from Shi'ar space. Current the new mutants um, adventure there. It was also alluded to that... Um, oh, yeah, and... Our, Gene, Havoc, and Cyclops went off into Shi'ar space with the King Egg. It also alluded to that uh, Cyclops isn't too happy with the fact that uh, his younger brother, uh, Gabriel, Vulcan, uh, has been partying so much with his, former, with his uh, old teammates. We begin with a flashback, with presumably to the end of War of Kings, with Gabriel falling in space. And gets seemingly grabbed by what appears to be the uh, Supreme Intelligence. And some aliens just studying him. Rather closely and um, but he, noting that Gabriel has a fire within him. True powers that are broken and twisted host. And so one of the, one of the aliens present wonders just how broken and how twisted. Gabriel wakes up and comes upon his uh, teammates, his old teammates, Petra and Sway. Apparently, uh, Petra has a tendency to uh, call Vulcan Emperor much to Gabriel's dislike. But Petra's making margaritas and um, basically and Sway then asks if they're drinking or are they drinking? Because, uh, she wouldn't mind turning these up to 10. Petra adding that, uh, she, you know, you know, why stop at 10? Let's turn these up to 11. There are a lot of very hot, medium-powered mutants on the island that would love to get down at the summer house. And Sway has some ideas she's noodling on, but she doesn't want uh, anyone judging her right now. And so, Petra asks what Vulcan says. Party or no party? Or party or party? 
thinks for a second and decides he's going to go for a walk. We get it, and we find out that the summer house is uh, far from the sea of tranquility, nestled in the shadows of the meridian fissure on the moon. One lunar mile from the blue area of the moon and the ruins of an ancient and alien civilization. Once it was a place of nightmares for mutants, but that past but that past has been put to rest. The pain of that memory erased forever. However, Vulcan notices walking plant life, and well, he discovers the Kotati settlement. And so he sees some of the you know, getting ready. And claims, you know, what they're what they've made is a, is some kind of engineering. And looking at everything, he, he assumes that uh, Earth is the general target of the weapon they're uh, building, and that uh, they're doing their best not to hit the island that his people call home, because that would be a mistake. They'll want to steer clear of Krakoa. He then adds that um, all the violence they're doing, it never ends well. Michael like Tati yeah, says something to him, and he, then some, he says that he knows. He understands where it comes from. You look, you know, one looks at humanity and finds them wanting. Look what they're capable of, and there's so little good to balance out all that evil. And he can see why, why the Kotai wanted to destroy them. He really can. But once you start down that road, you know, you stop and think, what does that make you? Back at the summer house, Petra and Sway are drinking. They're on their third martyr, they're on their third margaritas. Still no sign of Vulcan. They've been watching the direction he walked off in. And Sway asks if Petra wants to go after him. Petra's, Petra says that her head says yes, but her drink says no. So maybe in a minute. And then they see an explosion in the distance. And well, yeah. So Petra once again asks, do you want to go, go after him now? And or Sway asks if Petra wants to go after a Vulcan now, and he says, she says that now her head says hell no, and her drink says I'm delicious, please finish me. And Sway kind of says, you know, we'll give it a minute. Apparently, the, the weapon has been fired, and uh, they've managed to do Vulcan. Apparently, he fights like a wounded beast. The leader of the group says, let, you know, let them fight all they want. Let them build their buildings and mine the earth. The jungle always returns, and the flesh is always weak. Though, apparently, Vulcan speaks Kotati and tells them that uh, he, and warns them, he's holding back. However, the leader says that um, yeah, the meat might speak their tongue, but it also speaks lies, and because what meat has ever offered truth freely, they have ways of getting past that. The plant is held up, which begins to embed tendrils in uh, Vulcan's face. Stating that if Vulcan has anything to hide, they will know it. We then go back to Vulcan being studied. And they did some work on his mind as well, and it explains there was a flaw in, in him, an error in his existence, a crack in his firmament. It cannot be fixed. Vulcan cannot be fixed. So they've made him into something else. This explains Vulcan has good in him, some small microscopic measure that, given fertile soil, could grow into something more. Now, it would, now that's a cancer. I'm acceptable for the work they have set in front of, me, of him. So they've separated the two. Inside, hidden under the thin layer of that good, is the beautiful broken creature he is. They're going to release him back into the universe. That universe will seem as change. Reborn, healthy and whole, but this is but that is a shell. Underneath it, buried alive in a shallow grave, is the real him. 
you can explain that he can lie to himself, pretend to be better, to be unbroken, but they know what's waiting inside him, waiting to get out. And once again, he explodes, destroying the Kotati weapon and some of the Kotati as well. He then tells, explains to the Kotati the truth that um, they're going to die there today. And as he continues to fight the fight against the Kotati, Petra and Sway show up, asking if he's about done there. He then brings him as the three aliens who experimented upon him. And he claims he could break the moon in half if he wanted. And he doesn't want to be that way. And Sway tells them that they know, and that's one of, why don't they just get out of there? Petra offers to make them a drink. So they head back to the summer house. There's a, there was a note left by uh, Cyclops. Gabriel, you were asleep, so I didn't want to wake you. Jean and I are taking the kids to Chandelure for the day. I know we've talked about you getting out and not just staying at the house, and I really think you should reconsider it. I know coming back here to Shiar Space was out of the question. Maybe it shouldn't be. But doing the same thing over and over, each and every day, makes it hard to become someone new. I know that deep down that's what you want. And hey, I promise I'll be with you the whole way. Come fire, come war, come anything that would stand in the way. You're safe because you're with family. We'll probably be home after dinner. Love, Scott. And the picture on Chandel on Chandler, which, well, as we know from the previous view, did not come to pass. Looks like it was pull, pulled out of a uh, Marvel swimsuit special from the 90s. Scott and Jean walking on the in the, in the beach in the waters on the beach. Logan sitting off to the side with a bucket full of beers. Cable and Prestige also standing in their, in their swimsuits. But yeah, that is where the issue, or that is not where the issue is. We get an epilogue. A Kotari. Now, the Kotati trooper returns to one of the generals, explains that they've lost the entire Sunward node. Explaining that the node was completely consumed, atomized. There's one survivor, and the survivor quickly succumbed to his injuries. Before, however, before he died, he pointed Earth and muttered a single word over and over until he died. Krakoa. That is where the issue ends. Which then brings us to Empire Savage Avengers. This one's a one shot, so one story, that's that. In Mexico City, Conan's taking in a wrestling match. He's not really impressed. He, he gets that it's, it's, he gets that wrestling is fake. And he asks one of some of the locals when the real fighting starts, explains that this is not combat. Gets his burrito knocked out of his hands for it, and so Conan finishes his beer and then shatters the bottle on the head of one of them. When the giant tree branch grow, suddenly appears, ripping off the building's roof, and a root grows out from underneath the ground. Turns out it's a mooring for a warship. Conan figures it must be Krom, fearing that uh, Conan is growing soft. Apparently, Mexico City has been dis has been uh, selected for its dense population and low numbers of human threats. The idea is basically is to turn the the city's humans into fertilizer for the war effort. We see civilian Katadi troops moving out and taking civilians into part of the the mooring they've erected. The taco vendor is uh, trying to defend himself when Conan 
saves him. However, Conan explains that he's going to need the Bender's Blade. And kills the other Kotati. Takes an arrow to the arm. Probably tells the, ar the archer who shot him that the bow is a coward's weapon. The next arrow is sliced in half before, and uh, the archer himself has his head removed from his body. However, the more Kotati show up, Conan passes out. He uh, apparently the arrow was was poisoned. Comes to in, in snowy wastes in front of a giant young young scantily clad woman, saying that once again Conan finds himself where he doesn't belong. And the giant woman begins to pick, pick Conan up, and seemingly is about to eat him when uh, a black tendril shoots out towards him. It rips him from the hand about to devour him, and uh, it turns out to be a tendril from none other than Venom. Of course, the poison that he that uh, was introduced into. Conan's body was a hallucinogen. And so Venom says, hey, you know, I recognize you from Savage, Savage Land. You seem like a cool guy back when we were fighting that wizard. So I'm going to cut you some slack on being, you know, a little on the weird side. Gives him a quick, the previously on, basically gives him the short version. Space Alien just dropped out of orbit like, like Macho Man and totally screwed this mess of city up. And they... And so, you know, yeah, time to get to work. And uh, Eddie points to the morgue and says, we got to stop that. Conan looks at it and says, okay, we'll kill it together. And so they do. Conan kills a uh, Rosa Gotati through the wall of a... Uh, Presumably a strip club, and uh, shouts into the hole he left in the wall, you know, to arms, your city's under siege. Venom says, however, says that they're probably going to need some firepower. Well, I'll we'll, we'll take it that uh, they've got, should do. Venom says he'll get the, the tanker going, and um, suggests that Conan basically be a distraction. Conan eyes a uh, farmer using a uh, thresher against the Kotati and says that he will make sure that the Kotati are looking at him. As Conan arrives, one of, one of the Kotati kills the, the farmer driving the uh, thresher and uh, Conan uses the club that he's been handed by Venom, a uh, parking meter ripped out of the ground, to bash the head in of said Kotati and tells the farmer that he'll when he will that Conan will Conan tells the farmer he'll avenge him. Then Conan does ask one thing, you know before you before you die, please show me use this machine. One of the Kotati leaders asks what you know why things are going so slowly and then Conan shows up with the thresher and uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he slaughters the Kotati with the Thresher. It's actually kind of cool. Venom, meanwhile, has got the tanker fired up and uh, basically, you know, says, you know, fire in the hole and tells Conan to run. As the truck's getting ready to explode, Conan throws it at, or Venom throws it at the uh, mooring, saying, get trucked. No, really, that's what he says. It explodes, and yeah, it, it does a trick on destroying the mooring. Venom adds that uh, that's the biggest thing he's ever blown up that he meant to blow up. And apparently Venom was in, was in Mexico City wanting to take a look at the museums. Though, and when he told Conan that, um, Conan mis misunderstood him and figured he saw a museum heist. 
Tony's just, Venom just wants to enjoy the museums. He doesn't want to throw out culture from anyone. And apparently the, the war, the, the, the fight has uh, interrupted Conan's supper. Venom's hungry too. So they go back to the uh, taco vendor from earlier. Have some tacos and drinks. Apparently, Venom, with his size, well, you know, Venomed up with his size, is able to eat tacos two at a time and whole. I kind of envy him that, actually. But Conan laments that uh, undoubtedly local troubadours will sing songs of the day. The Green Invaders came here to die. But he's deeply troubled. So you can feel his heart sliding into this great melancholy again. There's nothing more demoralized than being stalked by an invisible enemy that he cannot crush. And for now, all he can do is take one battle at a time that will have to be enough. And that is where the issue ends. <clears throat> Clearly this takes place before the Serpent Crown uh, mini. <clears throat> Next up we've got Cat Empire, Cat America, number one. As stated in... Uh, Empire, Captain America is leading, is leading Earth's heroes, you know, power, super and, not, and otherwise, into battle. Getting an explanation of who the Katati are and what they're doing. They're in uh, Arlington, Virginia at Fort Myer, facing off against the, against the army. Um, there's no air... Lieutenant asks one of the uh, soldiers where the air support is, and Bennett says, it's all static, nobody's coming. The troops are ordered to the uh, vehicles, though it's claimed the vehicles are trash, they're not going anywhere. However, the vehicles do have 50 caliber, 50 caliber machine guns mounted on them. Then, Cap shows up. Saves the squad's asses. But the leader of the, the Katai leader present destroys the hovercraft that uh, Cap arrived on. And the 50 cows get put to good, loop, good use. Though Bennett has a tendril from the Katai leader shoved into his mouth. As the leader disperses. And it's probably going to tell Ben it's okay. The squad is uh, introduced. We Sergeant Major Cherry, Sergeant Russo, Specialist Bennett, and First Lieutenant Herrero. Cap compliments uh, Bennett's shooting, asking where, where he's going to shoot like that. And apparently, Bennett's grandpa used to take him shooting in the mountains a lot. Henry County, Virginia. Though Cap says, you know, probably not with a 50 caliber machine gun. And, um, it's true, not. It just kind of, kind of comes natural. So, Cap recruits them. They're headed to the Pentagon. And it, things aren't going well there either. Kotati are advancing, and, um, security is pushed back, is pushed up against the wall. And he, they they give they give any more ground. They they're going inside. Hero mentions that Bennett doesn't really look too okay. And he says he'll be fine. And it's funny, he doesn't feel quite himself. Is all. Cap shows up, goes to see Gerald Woodley, and basically says, you know, hey, look, you know, there's a numbers advantage. You know, air power, air, air and artillery should keep the capital under control. Snipers and artillery tar should target the ones with staves as they're the biggest threats. And apparently Cap explains he's come to, for a favor, though. The Avengers are doing all they can, but attacks like this are happening all around the world and see without, without their resources. They need armies. Our, you know, our allies need, need to see us supporting them, and so they'll support us and one another. There are reports of massive attacks in Mexico, South America, and Woodley cuts off Cap, stating that he appreciates that he appreciates what Cap brings to the table. 
making a point to note that Cap's rank is Captain, not General. But, apparently what Cap's proposing is well above his pay, Cap's pay grade. Woods is the senior soldier and his story, and they need their forces here. Cap explains that they've been invaded by a hostile force intent on wiping out all sentient life on the planet. Every ally that falls weakens them. And against this threat, every human being is their ally. Woodsley explains, however, he will not spend resources defending so-called allies who will never be in a position to return the favor. And that every service member, service member in, the, in the military is needed right here. That includes Cap. He's then told to get out there with the rest of the troops and wait for their instruction. And so, Guerrero asks what the general said. And Cap says that a long time explains that a long time ago we saw a maniac try to take over the world. A lot of people in charge said it wasn't our fight, that we shouldn't stick our necks out, so we waited until we didn't have a choice anymore. And that's not a, a mistake he's interested in making and repeating. The fighting is d not done here, not done here, but Washington DC has a resource to defend itself. The real fight is in the South. They've got soldiers and civilians fighting off Cotati attacks all along the eastern, eastern seaboard. And their allies in Mexico and South America don't stand a chance without, without them. And Captain understands that most of them are assigned to the military district of Washington, and he won't ask them to disobey orders when Herro says that they're not disobeying. There's only a few of them left there. As far as they're concerned, he, Cap's ranking officer. She then asks where they're going. Cap explains there's a National Guard unit pinned down at Fort Lee, just south of here. Russo, who kind of hollers a bit, explains they're kind of like Cowboy like Commandos. But Cherry notices Bennett's not there. In the Pen Pentagon, Woodsley's complaining about his meeting with Cap to him privately, to, you know, to himself. Bennett shows up, apologizing, and says that he, says that he's sorry, and he need, but he needs Woodsley to do something. Woodsley asks who he means, who needs, though it's about Roger as well. And Woodsley pukes up tendrils, which then infect Woodsley. And it seems that uh, Bennett is turning into plant matter himself. Near Mexico City, Chicanth, one of the, le one of the leader that dispersed, that fought Cap earlier, is rallying troops to invade Mexico City. However, ap uh, apparently this will likely be a, uh, you know, this is af probably, I would presume, after uh, Conan and Venom already helped get the first wave of troops out. They make an earthen, uh, basically a, a soldier truly of the earth. And heads towards Mexico City. And that is where the issue ends. Which then brings, which next brings us to Legion of Superheroes, number seven. Where we left off in Legion, uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, things aren't going too great for the Legion at the moment. They had, within a very short span of time, less, you know, we'll say less than a day or so, they've had more than a few emergencies. And the United Planets are not, are not happy with them. Our, um, to the point where the planet Rimbor that is withdrawn from the United Planets. So we get, there's, we are, uh, you know, previously on is this time given by a wildfire. But the Legion of Superheroes arrives um, at the United Planet Council Chambers. They, they would like to be heard by the, before the United Planets. He identifies themselves as leader of the Legion. And, yeah, that of Honor President Brandt tells him no. But, yeah, 
he had a rock as a listener. So he had an impassioned speech, which the man brought our president thanks him for. And she explains that the council just voted in favor of interplanetary sanctions against Rimbor for breaking any galactic laws or the Trident. Madam right Honor President Brandt gets to meet Superboy, and um, she's actually quite thrilled. She's heard so much. She's a few, huge fan of, her, of uh, Superman and uh, asks just why he's, he's there. He explains he was invited, and they were actually about to uh, vote on that point of order. Brainiac steps forward and says that uh, that won't be necessary, is this is Legion business. And yeah, it, it, it does it does not go well. I think C -SPAN. Imagine a Jerry Springer episode that was hosted by C SPAN, basically. Um Superway addresses the the United Planets, it was his, uh, his idea. And, um, funny that he was invited to this time to learn about the potential future, and at the same time, in part, whatever he, he knows about being a superhero to the Legion. Bringing this idea that we could exchange information in a way that, that would be beneficial to both eras. So far, it has been. Well, it's been something else. Though John does say that if, if his being that at that point in time is a hardship to her or anyone in the organization they shall go home. And uh, Madam Honor President Brandt uh, is like, okay, you know what? Yeah. Fine. Yeah, they made some excellent points and uh, especially the new Legionnaire, Superman. And he's like, I'm not Superman. Apparently, our Madam Honor President Brandt wants to would would that you know hopes that uh, that John is able to uh, make some time for her, you know, or maybe have lunch with her. And she does explain that you know she's quite glad that the Legion showed up, but next time schedule something. Should that girls thinking about the fact that. Um, yeah, the president wants to kill them all. She feels like she was insulted. Yeah, that, that's how Triple Girl is kind of dealing with all this. Meanwhile, Saturn Girl and Cosmic Boy are having an argument about uh, how Cosmic Boy is leading the team. And Cosmic Boy kind of feels like Brainiac, more often than not, isn't told you, he just does them without. And Brainiac, well, it, yeah, and also there's the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, Cosmic Boy tries to hide, but Saturn Girl knows them because, you know, telepath. So a team meeting is called. Meanwhile, Lightning Lad is uh, showing his parents her has got his parents a, uh, or his family, a new house, a new home. And, um, it can be, it looks just like their home on Winnath. All run down and... But, uh... No, no, no. So it get Computo remakes things to uh, the like the better likings of uh, Lightning Lad, Lightning Lad's mothers. Um, and then the, him and Lightning Lad last get the get the notification that they have to there's a team meeting has been called. So they all show up and uh, it's decided they're going to vote on. Uh, Who's the leader of the Legion? Seeing as how Cosmic Boy was appointed 
basically became leader because, well, either Lightning Lad or uh, Saturn Girl wanted to be leader. And enough members of the, of the Legion vote that yes, they will vote on a, on a new leader. So, Cosmic Boy is, uh, has himself as a candidate, as the um, Colossal Boy suggests uh, Super Boy. An Ultra Boy names himself. Also, it should be noted that uh, Superboy, when, when nominated, is like, uh, no. Like, I, I don't want to be a leader. I'm just, you know. I, I'm, just a, I'm a consulting producer type, that's all. And... There are three votes in favor of Cosmic Boy. Shadow Lass, Superboy, and Lightning Lad. With practically everyone else voting for Ultra for Ultra Boy. And so However some uh, the flash of light and uh, Ultra Boy asks if uh, his ten years leadership begins now. Rain forms that um as far as he knows, yeah. So he says everyone get behind him, and then, because it's Ultra Boy's father. Krav, leader of the planet, of the planet Rimblor. Explaining all members of the United Planets, this Legion of Superheroes, he declares that the Legion of Superheroes under arrest according to the laws of their planet. If they don't surrender, their deaths will be brought about. And that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to our final book of the week, The Plunge, number five. Where we left off in The Plunge, the crew of the, of the McCready had learned the tr had discovered the truth behind the uh, Durlith's crew, the missing crew of the Durlith, that their bodies were basically inhabited by extraterrestrial worms with highly advanced technology that they that has drawbacks to people. They also started to question the member of, of the crew they had that was aboard. And it, yeah, it's not going well. And so the captain explains that, uh, so Captain Carpenter explains that, uh, the guy they've got isn't alive. There's a bag, a bag of skin full of worms, and the crew of the Durlith, none of them are alive, not really. Though Lacombe agrees that they're not, that the crew of the Durlith isn't alive, but that's not saying they're as dead. They're infested, much of the, giving the, uh, analogy of a toppled tree full of termites. The tree is dead, but, thrown, but still thrown with life. And they take, they, they get, they manage to pick up at least one of the worms in a, in a specimen jar. And, um, So, they looked into, looking into Martin Murphy's death, it's explained that uh, Brimley died in the fire, but, uh, however, the thought was Brimley died in the fire. When the permanent port, though, he was killed by a blow to the head, probably from a hatchet. He was racking my mind, but he can't come up with a single living soul who'd want to kill poor old Brimley and cripple the ship. But when he said the suspect list to include dead people, he had a very obvious candidate. And so, their guest was a Trojan horse.
But he didn't have an exit, exit strategy. And so their guest explains that uh, Carpenter's been told everything he needs to know, and he's not afraid of what they might do to learn more, and he's indifferent to the form of torture that uh, he, that Carpenter was, would apply to his own kind. And so... Russell volunteers over and uses Psychic Walkman. You can tune into the thoughts, just like finding the AM, an AM station on the radio. Uh, but I was a little iffy about this, because apparently the last time he wore the Walkman, it did kind of, you know, almost took his brain. But, Russell explains, they don't really have, they don't have time to find another way, and they've got, because they've got tonight. And if anyone's got any other ideas, he's open to suggestions. No one does, however. Lacombe doesn't think Russell's also agrees that maybe it's not the best thing, the best idea. But also, you know, if Lacombe asks if his accent is because if Russell thinks it would work, why didn't he try it already? And Russell thinks he was scared too. It's like free diving. Human thoughts are right there on the surface. Their thoughts are down deep. I'm not sure you could go down that far and still make it back. The McCready's guest uh, explains that, he, that uh, no, he can't, that Russell can't, and inviting Russell to sink into their world of thought, as Russell will not return. But uh, the captain explains that. Uh, <laughs> Their guess is better hope Russell does return. Because if he doesn't, he's going to pick every worm out of his body and use, him as, and use each one as bait. And so Russell puts on the uh, Walkman and uh, begins to go through. It doesn't seem like he's... Uh, He's explaining that the worms aren't worms, they're reproductive cells. And what's in the hatch is an egg ready to make a baby. So now was a signal broadcast for thousands of miles. The squids killed themselves in despair. The bristle worms frenzy, it's frenzied, it's not it's their time. They wasn't they weren't lying. They'll all go go when the hatch opens to make the child. Child with a thousand eyes and there. <clears throat> However, during all this, Lacombe slips out and blocks the wheel, blocks the wheel on the door, so they can't get out. Lacombe mentions that. Uh, he doesn't think it's a good idea to open the door because passions are running high. He's afraid that they're all on the verge of making some very irrational decisions. Clark says that uh, you know he's not going to do anything irrational. Everything he's going to do to Lacombe is going going to make sense. But Lacombe is basically, you know, hey, look, they, they've offered us some amazing discoveries that would make the world a much better place. And we would be selfish and irresponsible to walk away from that. But Moriah does point out, what good are the discoveries if, if we're all dead? And so, McCready utterly destroys their the the ship's or carpenter destro utterly destroys McCready's guest. Weaver shows up seeing seeing Lacombe standing at the door and asks Lacombe what's going on and Lacombe takes the jar he's got he's got some of the he's got one of the, the uh, 
not worms in it, and smashes it on Weaver's face. And Russell is dead. So the crew of the Derlith rise on the on the Cree and they've come to an agreement with management. But Carver states that he's not gonna open the hatch. Or that none of them are going from the hatch. And, uh, in exchange for making the deal, Lacombe wants uh, to hold the ingot. Which gets knocked out of uh, Bill's hand. So the crew of the uh, McCready are, are chained to posts. And Mariah be given her dive gear. The tide's coming in, so it won't take long for the crew to, for the crew to die. Which means she better open the hatch quickly. So Mariah. Puts on her scuba gear. Counters a much bigger worm, but going after an orca. And a submarine as well. Before she arrives at the hatch. Which then brings us to the finale of Sea Dogs. Where we left off. The HMS Havoc has been destroyed. Not, nothing of the crew left but corpses sinking like dead one into the foaming Red Sea. Meaning the, the wolves won. And so one of them is pulling under uh, Genie, the, uh, the doctor's um, apprentice. However, um, one of the one of the last surviving crew manages to get get to her and start pull her away from the, the wolf. Genie stabs the wolf in the eye and to surface, and we get a brief uh, history lesson. Hurricane San Calisto, most popular hurricane in the 18th century, smashed the British fleet in the Sugar Islands. Many vessels were damaged beyond repair, and three ships of the line, Phoenix, Blanche, and Havoc, were lost with all hands. The war would drag fitfully on for another three years, but the Royal British Navy would never again employ their forces with such devastating advantage against the American colonies. The survivors come to on, on one of the Sugar Islands, and they're faced with a dog, which immediately causes Genie to jump a bit. However, upon realizing it's just a dog, Genie's relaxed and seemingly all is back to normal. And that is where the issue, and for that matter, Sea Dogs, ends. And that's it for this week's Comic Book Roundup. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in, this, in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, Live long and rock hard.